Good afternoon and welcome to today's energy seminar. Uh, to introduce our very special speaker today, we have a very special guest, Professor Ishui, uh, who as many of you know, uh, is now the director, recently appointed director of the Sustainability Accelerator at the Door School. Previous to that, among his many other jobs, he was the director of the Precord Institute for Energy, which is our kind of guiding light and benefactor. So we literally work for him on this seminar series, but now he's back in a different capacity to introduce our speaker today. He, of course, is a world-class uh, researcher in uh, electrochemistry, uh, nano science, and sustainability, actually doing uh, innovations across many different domains from energy, batteries, solar cells, water purification, air purification, a few other ones I probably forgot. Uh, just to end the introduction of E, um, he's uh, been awarded 28 prestigious uh, awards and honors, including the Global Energy Award in 2021 and five startups have uh, sprung out from his laboratory. So he's a very busy guy, and we're glad he is able to join us today to introduce our special speaker for today, E. Well, thank you very much, John. Uh, finally, I know how many awards I have won. Thank you for counting that for me. I never know. It says it on your National Academy page. So oh. Somebody probably put it there. <laughs> OK. Okay, I'm glad to know about this number, and thank you. Um, it's my uh, actual pleasure to introduce Cynthia Zhen. Let me tell you about a little bit about Cynthia. Um, about two years ago, I met Cynthia for the first time. Uh, he is currently still a PhD student at MIT and Operational Research Center. And she was telling me about the exciting research she has been doing uh, she entered in uh, BlackRock, SoftBank, on her way and making a lot of money. Then instead of uh, telling her about financing, because I know nothing about, I started to tell her about climate change, sustainability, and uh, presenting to her some of the problems we are thinking about. Cynthia said, well, that's uh, very urgent, that's important. She went back to MIT talking to her PhD advisor saying she wanted to switch the research topic into climate, climate adaptation, and so on. So in the past two years, she generated very, very interesting results. I said, why don't you come to Stanford to tell us about what you have been doing, what you have learned? Here we go. I think Cynthia now is back, ready to tell us about the results. But let me tell you, she picked a date of today to give the energy seminar. I think she used her AI model to know this extreme weather in the past few days happening right here. This gives the best background introduction about her research. This, it's, uh, this never been a even more important time compared to now to work on the climate adaptation. With that short introduction, Cynthia, take it from here. Thank you very much um, for the introduction. And uh, I am today here to talk to you about uh, weather forecasting. And disclaimer, I promise I did not bring the storm. It was not a part of the, <laughs> it was definitely a, um, a coincidence. So um, as uh, Professor Yi mentioned, I am uh, Cynthia. I am a fifth year PhD uh, candidate from MIT. And since I am have very honored here to talk uh, in front of uh, brilliant and uh, aspiring students at Stanford, I thought I might share a little bit about how I got here. So my academic journey has not been so linear. I did my PhD, uh, undergrad in mathematics in London, and then I actually worked in financial industry for about two years. Um, the work in finance was very exciting and very interesting, but I felt a drive to do something more impactful and meaningful with my work. So this drive led me back to pursue a PhD now at MIT, um, working with very uh, amazing advisor and aspiring peers. 
on some interesting problems for climate change. So, without, um, so I'm very honored and excited to share with you some of the work that we have been doing so far. Climate change undoubtedly is one of the most uh, pressing problems of our generation. Um, over the past century, we're seeing tremendous surge in the number of natural disasters worldwide. They're not only deadly, costing a lot of lives, they're also extremely expensive. So in the past 20 years here in the United States, the total loss amounted to more than 2.1 trillion US dollars. Okay. Is it better now? Okay. It's good? Um, great. So basically, kind of the goal that guided um, basically my PhD work um, is that in light of climate change, is there something we can do utilizing our knowledge in machine learning and optimization to facilitate climate change adaptation, to build resilience, and to aid sustainable development? So before I talk about how to do weather forecasting, let's first take a quick tour of history of how we got here today. The art of weather forecasting actually originated, uh, began with early civilization. Back in 340 BC, Greek philosopher Aristotle wrote Meteorologica, in which he documented his theories about the formation of rain and storm, etc. Also around the same time, uh, Chinese uh, astronomers developed this festival calendar in which they divided the whole year into 24 festivals, each of which cont contains a certain weather pattern. So over the next few centuries, as scientific methods developed and also measuring capabilities um, improved, that led to our understanding of the physical laws underlying the atmospheric uh, dynamics. So, Interestingly though, back in early 1900s, when the first dynamical model was introduced, um, it took Richardson, him working alone by hand, back then everything was calculated by hand, it took him several months to produce a wildly inaccurate six hour forecast for the town of Munich. So obviously that was not very helpful if you have to wait for several months to do so. So really, weather forecasting became kind of a more operational field when we started to use modern computers. Um, so it was Professor von Neumann and also uh, Charney, they started to do so. And back then, 50 years later, we finally had the first operational forecast. So kind of since then, up until now, weather forecasting has been predominantly made by these dynamical models using a very physics-based approach until AI started to change the game. So we are right now seeing exciting um, interest growing both in academia and in industry in how to use machine learning and AI to do weather forecasting. And DeepMind is really leading the way in producing operational uh, deployment. They have been working with the UK Meteorology uh, Department and actually just a few weeks ago, um, well, uh, more than a few weeks ago, but last year, end of last year, they released a uh, graph cast. So it is the first time in history where machine learning model outperformed the best dynamical model. So. In my lab, we started to work on this topic since the beginning of my PhD. And I'm here today to tell you more about how we take a similar approach to do forecasting of tropical cyclones or hurricanes. So why is AI really taking off now? Why not earlier? Like in many other sectors and fields, it is the increasing computing power, 
data availability, particularly driven by satellite image uh, observations, and also processing techniques. And in particular, because of the growth of computer vision, natural language processing, and time series uh, techniques, we are able now to do what is called multimodal machine learning, which is uh, really at the frontier of machine learning, where you're trying to synthesize data from different modalities and sources. So my PhD work centers around the development of this multimodal machine learning framework. And um, as mentioned earlier, I have worked on it. Um, so, so my group at MIT actually focuses uh, primarily on healthcare applications. So I have been working extensively for health healthcare applications to develop the kind of the technology to do multimodal machine learning. But my, my interest is really in weather, um, weather forecasting and also climate forecasting. So I have adapted, kind of leveraged um, the experience there to predict weather events such as hurricanes and floods. So the technology itself is very cool and exciting, but really what excites me personally is the vast and profound implications this technology enables us to do. Imagine that you can now forecast flooding events for your house, say three to five years, then you might do something different to protect your family. And as a society, we might do urban planning, um, infrastructure planning and insurance very differently if we are able to forecast risks in a very different way. So I have been working on applying it for insurance pricing and also sustainable manufacturing. But the focus of the talk today is kind of how um, to do weather forecasting using machine learning. So to introduce the concept of multimodal machine learning, um, I would start with kind of a folk story from uh, India. So this is a group of blind men trying to touch an elephant. So depends on where you touch the component of the elephant, you might infer very, very different um, uh, outcome. So you would only be able to know it's an elephant if you kind of go around the elephant and take data samples from multiple sources and places. And this is kind of the idea behind multimodal machine learning. So how we started to work in this field is really from healthcare. And it is really a natural way of thinking and inferring. When you go to the doctor, um, when you have a lung problem, for example, the doctor would you know, prescribe a chest x-ray and the doctor would think about your chief complaints and the doctor would also think about your age, your gender, your past medical history, and take all of this into account to make a final decision. But when you look at this, this is across multiple sources and modalities of data, ranging from images to language data to tabular data. So if we can make an algorithm that is able to make decisions and inference by synthesizing data, then it should be better than thinking about each individual um, modalities. And this is exactly the idea behind multimodal machine learning. Um, and really, kind of the framework is very general. And the application is also very, uh, uh, very vast, ranging from self-driving cars to weather forecasting, healthcare, you know, recommender system, etc. So when you think about data fusion and synthesizing data, there are generally three strategies to do so. That is early fusion and end-to-end -end pipeline. Um, there is the late fusion on the other end, which is basically consensus model. So you would have each individual models and take an average consensus. Then there is the mid-fusion approach, which is basically kind of something in between the two extremes. 
based on our experience, we have found mid-fusion strategy to be the most performing and also um, the, the most versatile for reasons I will explain next. So here is kind of an illustration of the overall uh, multimodal framework, um, taking the mid-fusion approach. So we have different sources and types of data. We process them in, uh, individually and then we concatenate the features in the, uh, from different data sources in the feature space. Then we make the downstream uh, prediction. One of the advantages of this approach is that in the first step, we can leverage some state-of-the-art processing techniques. Um, for example, um, right now everyone is talking about the large language models, so we can use them to process language data. And as the models themselves evolve, we are able to update and upgrade our processing techniques as well. And this approach allows us to add data and take away data very easily, making experiments extremely easy to do. And in addition, in the downstream case, we can once again leverage different prediction models based on different needs. So for example, for example, in the healthcare domain, um, interpretability is very important and figuring out which features um, contribute to the model is also an important um, task. So we might take a regression model to do so. Um, and it, when thinking about kind of the overall performance plus um, computational cost, maybe tree-based approach are more uh, faster and cheaper. So the first uh, example that I'm showing today is on hurricane forecasting. So the science of hurricane is that they are rapidly um, rotating storms that originates from the tropical warm ocean waters. So they draw energy from the ocean, from the water, and they, make, they release energy um, through rainfall especially when they um, make a landing. So in order to protect our communities, we need to know basically where it's going and also how, what is the magnitude of this hurricane. And these are track and intensity forecasting tasks separately. When there is a hurricane, um, typically this is what you see on the news, which is um, in the field, they call it a spaghetti model because each line uh, represents one model forecast. And overall, we would take an average consensus of each individual model. And broadly speaking, in the field of hurricane forecasting, there are three categories of models to do so. Obviously, the most performing ones are dynamical models. Um, as highlighted here, uh, GFSO and HWRF are kind of the leading two dynamical models. One is run by the um, Amer uh, North American NOAA, the uh, North American Weather Forecasting Agency. And the second one is run by the European Weather Forecasting Agency, which is typically what we discuss in the news, the North American model and the European model. In addition, there are statistical models and also ensemble models. And typically, if there is an official guidance, um, it's made of an ensemble model, which is kind of taking a weighted average of each individual operational models, either dynamical or statistical. Um, statistical models are typically a very simple regression-based model. So uh, it's kind of the precursor of machine learning approach by looking at um, pattern recognition. So in this task, we set ourselves to forecast hurricanes by taking a multimodal machine learning approach. And specifically, we take two modalities of data. Um, the first one is historical storm data, which is typically the data used for statistical models that consist of certain basic features such as the basin of the hurricane, the time right now, latitude, longitude, etc. In addition, we couple that with uh, reanalysis maps. 
So reanalysis maps are kind of, they come in a picture format. So basically, they look like a satellite imagery picture with each pixel representing um, kind of the numeric value of a certain atmospheric character. In this case, we have taken the wind speed uh, of the U, V, and Z direction at three atmospheric levels. Um, so basically, that is kind of nine pictures at each time step. So here I'm presenting uh, the results for hurricane forecasting. Here, um, this is for intensity task, and I'm uh, showing the mean absolute error and also standard deviation for standalone machine learning, and op we are comparing ourselves to operational models. So the first two lines you see here are all of the machine learning models that we have trained. And the last three lines are the most advanced operational models from um, st statistical approach, and the last two are more dynamical approach. We compare results in two different basins because the behavior of um, hurricane is very different in the two basins, in Eastern Pacific and North Atlantic. And these are the out-of-sample uh, experiments we have conducted using the last three years of the data set that we had. So that uh, kind of accounts for 2016 and 2019. So here we see that the most, um, so, so in Eastern Pacific uh, Basin, the most advanced uh, machine learning model shows very competitive results with the most advanced weather forecasting uh, dynamical models. Uh, in North Atlantic Basin, on the other hand, um, dynamical models outperform slightly to the machine learning models. However, it is noteworthy that although um, that, that these machine learning models, most of the training um, and cost of training and the time of training com uh, comes before, so we pre-train the model, and the deployment time is basically seconds and we can run trained model on a personal laptop to make predictions. Whereas those uh, dynamical models, they're typically run at supercomputers in national labs, and the runtime is usually four to six hours. So machine learning models are able to actually make real-time forecast using the re uh, latest data available. So that's kind of comparing alone machine learning model versus uh, operational model. But what is actually more exciting is that we thought, OK, since official forecasts are typically a consensus model, why don't we try to add a machine learning model to the consensus model and see how they work with other models? And what we have found is that when you add machine learning model into uh, a consensus model, we actually outperform the official forecast in two basins um, by a little bit. So this is extremely encouraging for the kind of the future of adding machine learning into uh, one of the operational models. This is all great. Um, obviously, uh, it comes with, it, can, it can, cannot be a fairy tale that everything is so great. You might ask, okay, so that, then why don't we just deploy it already? So there are certain limitations, and one of which is that I mentioned that we use reanalysis maps. So reanalysis maps are available um, retrospectively, so they are obviously, um, unfortunately, not available in real time, but it is the best quality of data that we can access to for academic purposes. Uh, and the second problem, or the second extension, is that we started this work at the beginning of my PhD about four years ago. And in between, a lot of things have happened. For example, there is the large foundational model, the emergence of large foundational model, and also the emergence of um, kind of natural language processing as a technique. So basically, we need to leverage um, these models. And also, we need to add additional modalities of data 
um, because adding more rich data into a multimodal approach is always going to lead to better results. Kind of these two thinking led to the second project that we did for flood prediction. So basically, kind of how I started this uh, flood prediction was at the time I was really brainstorming with my advisor which natural disaster to pick. So we had a map, we had kind of a chart that says, oh, these are the earthquake, droughts, wildfire, and obviously flooding. And the reason that we picked flooding was at the time uh, Pakistan was hit um, terribly by flooding. And there were lots of Pakistan students basically fundraising outside MIT and Harvard. And I personally had friends who are from Pakistan and the economy was just destroyed because the whole country was submerged, uh, a third of the country was submerged uh, underwater for several months. And this is devastating for a developing country. So then we decided, okay, maybe we, we want to do flood prediction. And kind of the nice thing is that when we use satellite images, we actually don't depend on developing countries such as Pakistan to have high level of quality of data because you know, satellite images are available globally and therefore we are able to leverage um, this available data to do forecasting um, on a global scale. So kind of a, kind of a quick uh, overview of how existing approach um, uh, how, what is the existing approach to flood uh, risk mapping? So the kind of, there are short-term forecasts and long-term forecasts. The short-term forecasts typically are depend on the hydrodynamical models, which are once again physics-based modeling. They're rather local scale. And also, when you want to stretch the forecasting horizon, then arrow propagates because you're always kind of feeding the prediction into the model. For long, longer term risk maps, for example, if I wanted to know what is the risk of flooding in five years, um, they're typically kind of historical flood risk maps. And you know, one of the issues is that they're kind of historical looking and therefore unable to deal with the changing climate. So for this work, we decided to take three modalities of data. Um, in addition to the statistical mod uh, data and also satellite images, we decided to leverage language data. So language is, you know, it's a, it's a data that is extremely vast and available on a lot of topics, but the problem is that it's very unstructured. So uh, thanks to you know, right now the growth of natural language processing and everyone is kind of becoming more and more dependent on large models such as uh, ChatGPT, we're able to better utilize language data. Um, and in this case, we thought about using Wikipedia's geography section to take in consideration of the ge geography features of a certain place. Because basically at the time I was reading a lot of those hydrodynamical model papers and I realized that a lot of the times you need to know what is the river location and kind of the topological features and if there are mountains and oceans to be able to understand the geography of a certain place. Um, if you search Wikipedia, it actually has a lot of the information. For example, there is a lake nearby, there is ocean nearby. So this is the approach that we took. So um, I have to present kind of a not a semi available, semi ready uh, um, results because um, this is still kind of ongoing work that we're trying to do. But those preliminary results show us very promising uh, numbers that basically show us that if we take a machine learning approach, we're able to forecast um, extreme events such as flooding up to years in advance. And obviously we're still trying to refine and improve the results. This is already extremely promising. And that shows the potential of using such an approach and especially taking a multimodal approach um, can have for you know, um, tailgate events such as flooding. 
So kind of combining the two uh, examples, I'm sharing certain lessons that I have learned during this uh, experience. So the first lesson that I have learned is that multimodal um, approach typically outperforms single modal approach. And the second lesson that I have learned is that machine learning models are able to produce very competitive results um, to dynamical models, but in a fraction of simulation time. And the last lesson is that scalable machine learning models can have the potential to produce long-term risk models that would have basically profound implications to many, many fields, infrastructure, urban planning, and insurance. So because I honestly think that this is super exciting, and that's why I'm trying to pursue an academic career to continue the work and to refine the technology and to broaden the impact. So I have worked on hurricanes and flood, but obviously a similar technology can be applied for droughts, wildfires, and earthquakes, etc. And that would really change how the society work in many, many aspects, such as agriculture or renewable energy planning, for example, as we shift into more um, renewable energy uh, supply, then if there is, say, no sun, then we cannot afford to have a blackout. So basically, the capability to know and to forecast weather in advance um, help us make decisions to make our society not only more efficient, but also more safe. So this is all I have prepared for the talk, and uh, I'm very happy to take uh, any questions. Thanks, uh, Cynthia. That was uh, terrific. Very exciting research, very exciting research directions. I especially appreciate uh, uh, letting us know a little bit about what's underneath all those storm track uh, hurricane uh, storm tracks that you see on cable news constantly at certain times of the year. Also commented um, by uh, some political leaders and others. Uh, so we do have uh, about 15 minutes for questions in the room. Uh, we usually start with student questions. Hi, Cynthia. Thank you so much for the great talk. So um, the nonlinear dynamical systems that governs a lot of these systems, they are known to be chaotic, mm -hmm. which means you, know, you have to run the simulation like for four hours to know exactly what the system is going to be doing. Mm -hmm. And normally, given a system, you can actually derive mathematically a time horizon beyond which you cannot predict anymore. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm wondering, how does the machine learning approach uh, address this problem? Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for the question. So basically, you're absolutely right. Um, kind of, we picked hurricanes to forecast, and at the time, people thought we were crazy because it's known to be very chaotic, and it's one of the most notorious tasks. Um, but basically, what we observe is that the results that I show here are for 24-hour um, advance forecast, and basically, both dynamical models and machine learning models are able to make reasonable forecast, although not very accurate. Um, as you see, standard deviation is pretty large compared to the MAE. Um, but when we actually stretch the testing horizon to 48 hours, we observe that actually both dynamical models and machine learning models stop producing reasonable results. So basically, it is most likely due to the chaotic nature that you know, things ev evolve drastically as you, prop um, as you stretch the forecasting horizon. Other questions? Yeah, so Cynthia, for that uh, hurricane, so if you expand the learning, expand the learning, so you have what, so far it's 2016 to 19, you said, right, that, that, that learning. You expand the learning, would you be able to, based on the past data, increase your uh, Based on the machine learning approach, uh, the accuracy will increase, the error bar will be reduced. So what's your... Uh, yeah, um, yeah. Thank, thank you for the question. So 
actually the testing period is 2016 to 19, so it's three years, but we actually use data from 1980 um, as the training data to, to up until 2016. Um, however, the issue is that we didn't have access to earlier data um, because reanalysis maps were not available before then. But um, generally speaking, as you increase the data set and the availability of data, machine learning models tend to increase the performance. Yeah, can I ask one more? Sure. Uh, no matter it's hurricane or uh, the flooding, um, I'm also wondering what about you know, people's response to adapt? Let's see if you can predict and say, hey, the flooding is likely coming this time window, then uh, what would uh, otherwise people do? Uh, a building infrastructure, of course, is very expensive. Mm -hmm. And uh, you must be thinking about you know, how people can respond. I remember when California having this, uh, the, the, the power consumption this last year, right, John? It's, uh, it's looking, it's going to exist certain threshold. Then we all get text message and say, go home and uh, reduce your air conditioning need or something like that. And, and then suddenly just uh, several gigawatt of power is reduced. Um, I'm interested in the response part of uh, uh, based on the machine learning and mm -hmm. uh, this outcome. Yeah, because to see what you think. Yeah, I think definitely this is a great point. I think that um, one of the kind of one of the key advantages that I believe machine learning model has is the capability to use real-time data to make forecast um, at the spot. So I think in terms of response and emergency uh, response, especially being able to update forecast models um, using the latest data um, at a shorter uh, frequency is able to kind of be very helpful to save many, many lives. So, because the dynamical model typically take a few hours to run results, and at the time, you know, things might have evolved drastically. So I think definitely this is a very uh, interesting angle. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, if I could intercede, there, there is a lot of research now on dynamical multi-sector models, and I think your general uh, conclusion regarding the synthesis of the structural physics models and the, the uh, machine learning models mm -hmm. holds over. So I think an exciting thing would be to work with people who do that kind, of, for someone like you to work with those people, and they do both the physical and, although it's harder, human, human response, human uh, adaptation options, and meld everything together. I think that would probably lead to much better operational results than we now have. The, We've actually looked pretty carefully at the flood map mm -hmm. approach, and it's actually, frankly not very useful at all for people who are actually trying to make decisions on the ground. I think we have one over here, and then back, two back over here. Yeah, uh, thanks for your talk. I wanted to ask about the multimodal uh, ML. I can understand in, in general why it's useful, but particularly on disasters, um, where do you think the textual information will help and I, like in the example you showed it didn't seem to be helping that much but maybe there's things you have in mind where there's information captured in the text that actually help pinpoint mm -hmm. uh, where things might happen yeah so actually I didn't add the slide but for example um, I can give an example here. so for example is David Lobel who's our expert on uh, food security <laughs> So yeah. So here is kind of a thank you for the question. So basically, here is the backup slide that I didn't include. Um, so basically, for hurricanes specifically, there is a lot of experts who describe the behavior of the hurricane in a text style. For example, um, I give an example here. So there is a lot of kind of the characteristics of a hurricane. Um, specifically, um, and being able to leverage that uh, from a language format probably has some additional insights into uh, different other types of uh, more structured data. So this is one example. Example that the text didn't add much to what you already have with the, the statistical. So for the for the flooding one, the uh, actually adding text helped uh, a little bit. 
Um, but the overall results are not so great. The RCA you see we had the highest was around 0 0.75, which is why we're still continuing to kind of improve this by adding more satellite uh, imagery data from topological features as well as uh, climate features. But we're still doing experiments, so I unfortunately cannot share more <laughs> encouraging results at the moment. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Cynthia, for such an amazing presentation. You mentioned your near-term risk and then long-term risks. I'm wondering, could you elaborate a little bit more on how you have envisioned this result to what are the indications for long-term climate adaptation, especially in the exciting field about renewable energy penetration and infrastructure planning? Because those um, designing take a, a long time. I'm wondering how this model can help us have a better and smarter design in those areas. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. So I kind of come back to this um, page of results. So basically, kind of when I started to do this work, basically I tried one year flooding prediction, two years and five years. And it usually when you think about it, my first instinct would be five years would be harder than one year, at least in the healthcare uh, sector, it's harder to predict the outcome five years than one year. So my, I'm kind of hardwired to think that, okay, longer is worse. But actually in this one, results show that we don't see a decline in accuracy over the kind of the horizon. And in some certain cases, it is even easier to forecast the probability of a place having um, a flooding event in the next 10 years versus one year. Because if this place is more prone to flooding, then 10 years is kind of a longer window for it to happen. And in this lens, I think that kind of it's kind of the opposite of normally how predictions work. And this kind of uh, longer time horizon um, is able to allow decision makers and policy makers to make uh, have enough time, say, to do infrastructure planning, um, to prepare, for example, a better drainage system in certain areas, or build better dams, etc. Thank you for your question. Uh, thank you for your talk. You, as a future thing, you suggested renewable energy planning. How would you take into account the geopolitical factors that might affect this in a model like this? Um, if I'm uh, most dependent on subsidy policies, right? Are they predictable? How would you take into account? Um, I guess you're asking <laughs> a, a machine learning engineer from MIT to comment on the geopolitical implications <laughs> of uh, flooding. I think I'm right. The, the idea here would be to mm -hmm. do better predictions of, of wind uh, as it, it is input to wind machines. So how to configure them. There's lots of research on how to configure them, how to space them out. Uh, what locations to put them in, is that correct? Um, so it's more what you could do with a wind farm, where is the best place to put a wind farm and get the maximum output from it. And then the politicians can, use, however they do it, they can use that information as some of the input to their decision-making process. So whenever you have an opportunity, so since it's so hard to <laughs> cite these things, whenever you get a chance to do one, it's very good to optimize the maximum output effective output you get at the right time. Yeah, I, I suppose that kind of, at least personally, um, I personally haven't thought about this, uh, the geopolitical implications. And obviously, when you think about energy these days, especially with the war, etc., it is an unavoidable topic. Um, but frankly speaking, I am kind of taking more of a utilitarian approach thinking that how can I make um, the overall energy system, perhaps on a local scale, more efficient um, and more resilient against climate events, for example. Yeah. Yes, um, thanks for your great speech here. And I'm just very curious because I think there was a tiny hurricane <laughs> happened in Stanford yesterday. <laughs> so I was wondering, uh, what is the minimum level of the hurricane this model could forecast? Um, yeah, so, uh, so it, well, I 
think that so basically when you think about a hurricane so a storm so basically a storm um, when it passes a third certain threshold it is categorized as hurricane so basically at least from our work we only work predominantly with storms that are already big enough to be categorized as hurricanes um, but I think that it really in terms of um, what is the minimum threshold of uh, a storm that can be used, uh, can be uh, applied for, uh, can, can, can machine learning apply to predict, it really depends on the training of the model. So in our experience, we made the conscious decision of only predicting hurricanes. But if one were to develop a different model by taking data sets from all storms, then you know the the kind of the threshold doesn't necessarily need to be there. It's more of a modeler's um, a choice. Does that answer your question? Okay, great. Other questions? I have one last one. I've always been puzzled by a set of results that came out of the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration Colorado office about 10, 15 years ago. So see if you can help me understand why this might be. And that was, that was a, in many of the climate predictions people have done, this is mostly historical comparisons mm -hmm. of uh, the big uh, climate runs that do take a lot of time to run. Uh, if you just take a combination of the existing forecast, you do better, uh, retrospective forecast, you do better than any of the individual models. Any idea where that, where that might be? Yeah, so basically this is kind of, uh, Kind of the, the, I guess you're asking why uh, ensemble models, for example, you have many, many uh, spaghetti model, and then you take an ensemble, yeah, it's a uh, like a, a weighted average, it would tend to be better than each individual one. Um, I think that really kind of, I would say part of the reason is due to the chaotic nature of such um, hurricane um, evolution. So basically when things are chaotic, the outcome is extremely different based on the very sensitive input that you put. Um, and every model comes with certain errors and kind of wisdom of the crowd when you take um, more consensus and kind of averaging, canceling the errors, the results tend to be better. It's kind of like a law of large numbers or something like that. Yeah. It's just large. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? So I have lots of more technical questions. Here's another one. Here. Mm -hmm. Last one. This is the last one. Yeah, I'll just do that. Yeah, actually, I just I just realized this. So, um, have you thought about kind of like augment your your real data from simulations to your machine learning model? So what I mean is like you can simulate a hurricane that ha hasn't happened before. Mm -hmm. so people haven't seen this type of hurricane before, and now you simulate it, and then you add that data as if it's real data to your machine learning model. Mm. So, yeah, that's a great point because uh, basically one of the critiques of um, our approach is that most of the um, data that we use to train, all of them are historical data. And as you know, climate ch uh, increase and in the sea um, temperature grows, a lot of the uh, meteorologists are suspecting hurricanes to be more stronger, to have more intensity. And that is a major weakness uh, for us to take a machine learning approach using only historical data. And what you mentioned could be a great idea to complement the data set to basically train our models to be able to learn from more d p potentially bigger hurricanes that haven't happened yet. So I think it's a, it's a great point. Thank you. Definitely food for thought. Yeah. Uh, so with that said, uh, thank you very much, Cynthia, for a, a very good talk that uh, opened our eyes to a lot of new horizons that you're working on. We'll look forward to seeing results in the future. And thanks to the audience thank for you. excellent questions. Thank you very much.